Hi all. I had a very interesting uh, club game last night, um, uh, fulfilling the idea of trying to create imbalances. But um, okay, the end result wasn't great. I lost, but the game was fun and, and maybe instructive. I think part of uh, the game's instructiveness actually, I, I made one or two bad pawn moves, and um, I'm thinking let's do a Karate Kid exercise before I get into the game. Uh, a Karate Kid style like monotonous exercise which you may find boring or you might find instructive okay and it's to do with strategic crush and the notion of garbage pawn moves which is an expression my good friend Alex has been using recently in club matches garbage pawn moves um, is actually being coached by a strong uh, grandmaster and that's uh, been identified I think as, as one of um, Alex's um, game issues but I think definitely it's it's in my games as well I'm often making quite reckless pawn moves without really considering the major implications a recent over the board game for example I had played you know e4 and, and and c4 and you know weakening d4 okay what karate kid exercise could we do uh, you know a monotonous one which might emphasize the need to play solidly and I, I've been thinking that knights they have access to both colors of squares this knight could reroute, uh, for example, uh, to get to get to any colour of square. That's a property of a knight. You'd agree, okay? Now the reason I mention that is I thought of an exercise which might actually be useful to me, and okay, it might be useless to you, but I'm, I'm going to mention it anyway. Let's let's look at pawn moves. Say we played a4. Now let's visualise a black knight hopping to b4 because we've just weakened b4 let's do the same thing with b4 we've weakened a4 and c4 so visualize black knights on a4 and c4 so let's repeat the exercise so we see we see the weaknesses and imagine you know closer to the center that these knights are going to be more and more centralized and they're currently in our position so we're allowing knights in potentially basically that's the strategic risk of all these pawn moves. Every pawn move carries strategic risk. Someone said that after e4 White's game is in its last throws and unfortunately um, was it Breyer? It was Breyer, yes. That was his name. So is White's game in its last throws? If you get a knight to d4 or f4 maybe it could be a source of disaster. Imagine a knight on f4 eyeing your king's side you know, and h3, and if you played h3, there's always that bishop takes h3s. Maybe your game is in the last rows as soon as you play e4. Let's carry on the exercise, and I'm going to relate it then to, to a couple of other things. So g4, we're weakening potentially f4 and h4. So this starting to be not monotonous, I hope. So g4, we're weakening g4 for potential knight. Or a bishop, or any other piece, really. But the knights can hop to any color. They've got access to any color of square. So actually, you know, you could be a bit creative to really just de by default visualize a knight coming in. As soon as you play d4, a knight comes in to c4 or e4. Now, let's um, imagine you know d4 has been played, and. Um, now let's let's practice the d pawn. If we play d5, we're weakening c5 and e5 for a knight potentially coming in. Okay, giving black a token move. If we played e5, we're weakening d5 and f5, and we see that in like the French defence. Often, you know, f5 is important. The light squares are important. Exchanging off the light squared bishop to get to emphasise f5. You know, maybe manoeuvre a knight to f5 at some point. So we see that in the French defence. But um, d5 is particularly interesting. Do you remember the British Championship once when you know a few years back when I was I was really um, I played um, an unusual system actually. I played uh, to provoke a quick d5 from the opponent to get a nice knight on c5. The whole video was actually titled "The Knight on C5." And that was a big turnaround. You know, I was really, really happy winning that British Championship game. But it all started, you know, provoking this quick d5 from from White. This unusual system, which I think um, 
the late t Tony Miles was playing a lot. Um, so the idea to provoke these uh, weaknesses. So you, you can see that every pawn move, imagine the pawn going from f4 to f5, knight outposts on e5 and g5. You play um, h5, there's a knight outpost potentially on g5 at minimum. Okay, so we've got the idea. Every pawn move, you can visualize knights coming in. So if you play d5, you're giving c5 and e5. If you play e5, you're giving that, those two squares. If you play f5, you're giving these two squares. You get the picture now. Okay. This might not have been very useful so far. But, you know, I gave up the Sveshnikov. Let's have a quick look at the Sveshnikov in favour of the French defence, you know, a while back. Um, and the Sveshnikov creates imbalances. Yes, it does weaken d5. But uh, White's losing some time in, like, the main lines uh, with these knight movements. So there's bishop f6, well, there's knight d5 here. Look at that d5 square. Has black really done a lot of damage, weakening both this square and this square? Well, there's imbalances to compensate. Um, so in, in, this, in this line, you know, black's getting, for example, the two bishops. And, uh, you know, active play maybe on, on the g5. There's compensatory factors for that d5. Something to bear in mind now, you know, in, in, in my history as a player, you know, I'd given, given up the Sveshnikov. So I was fed up of these knights because white was like neutralizing my counterplay quite often and exploiting, you know, my light squared weaknesses. Especially get rid of this guy for this guy. These holes become even more significant. You know, moves like bishop e2 maybe to g4 later when this pawn's with the exchanged. Okay. So, I've got knight outposts on the mind at the moment. And it's all to do with last night's game. And, okay, we can say that strategic crush, especially a classic example, a big knight on d5, is evident in, say, you know, Sicilian Sveshnikov quite often. And, you know, Kasparov has been winning games sometimes in Sveshnikov, even sucking the exchange to get rid of, you know, Black's defender of the light squares to get a you know, huge knight on d5. For example, there was a Kasparov Shirov game. So anyway, every pawn move is potentially creating quite vicious knight outposts. And I think this could be significant to, in order to recognize uh, lesser evil strategic decisions. So uh, I was playing uh, someone slightly higher rated uh, last night, Robert Wilmoff, who actually also plays for Barnett Chess Club in a different league in the Hearts League and North, North Circular. Um, unfortunately, yeah, I was in the Middlesex League and I was played, playing against my fellow club mate. So B3, I played B3 to try and uh, get out of theory, just, just play an interesting game. Okay, every pull move, yes, carries weaknesses. So this carries weaknesses and potentially, though I, I want to you know, get a strong bishop on diagonal. Larson used to play this anyway. So I thought I'd give it a punt. And we get a kind of reverse French defence. I play now d4, and he plays e4. And note, you know, e4 is weakening f4. Okay. So we, we're getting an interesting strategic uh, battle already. So why would black want to weaken f4? Well, if I get a knight to f4, maybe, you know, later there's g5 potentially. And it could be used as part of a pawn storm. You know, if black gets in f5, f4, that could be a thematic break. Imagine a bishop later on d6 if d5 has been played. And he's pointing down at my king's side. The problem with all this is that I could castle queen's side, for example. That's one problem. So I play c4. And after f5, let's add an, an engine of bits up. From a theoretical point of view, you know, I, I think I was, I was doing well here. And I'm playing an interesting move now, knight h3, which I would have played in French defence in reverse, like recently. There was a killer knight h6, I don't know if you remember that game from the London Classic. So I'm pouncing onto that f4 square. Remember that e4 has created the f4 weakness. Knights have got access to any colour of a square. So a lovely knight on f4, and I thought I was doing well here. In fact, rip gives a slight advantage to white here as well. And I secure the knight outpost now, but maybe this is not so hot. There was no need, uh, maybe, for this next move, but it's okay. It's, it, Ribka kind of likes it anyway as well, h4. It's got some dynam dynamic potential with h5s. 
it's it clamps down on black playing g5 but after castles h5 is a bit committal although again ribkin likes this move i could have just got on and tried to castle queenside i think my major blunder comes uh later so h5 is interesting because i'm forcing now the bishop to go to h8 and i play this um knight h5 now okay knight h5 knight d5 is also interesting so imagine knight e7 take and now bishop e2 and i could get on with just casting queenside and maybe later even consider like f3 you know because if ef gf and i can you know get a rook well it will be on d1 to g1 so a larson style sort of attack that would have been nice but no knight, knight h5 is slightly inferior i think uh it's not as centralized um but uh, even so i think I'm, I'm still standing better here at this point in the game but here now we should remember our karate kid exercises okay there's a choice of two lesser evils which i didn't really consciously very clearly realize during the game at all that okay black has got a strategic threat to potentially give me a temporarily bad bishop with d5 so that's kind of one of the evils i face but why would it be a lesser evil for example uh, well not to play the move d5 go back to our exercises i played d5 here what have i weakened i weakened c5 and e5 and unfortunately in this position it's quite evident that e5 in particular is the more exploitable weakness through this knight maneuver and this starts to be a major issue now in my position uh, very soon he first plays knight g4 though so keeping both knights on the board and black there's been a significant evaluation shift actually with this one move with this one move d5 from an engine perspective remember engines are just really calculating machines but from an engine perspective d5 is also throwing away going from 0.54 to 0.11 you know black's virtually equalized and really i think that's because the engine has calculated variations of knight g6 to e5 a centralized knight bearing down tactically will bear tactical fruit because it's eyeing these squares tactically you know it's quite a powerful centralized knight outpost it's not like playing move a5 giving b5 as you know a knight on e5 is quite a monster knight so d5 you know if let's imagine that i did allow d5 from black you know here it's not even that possible i'm winning material here because of, of the diagonal you know the bishop's going to skewer the, the queen so it's not even practical to play d5 in this position uh, so let's imagine black prepares d5 with with knight g4 you know is it actually possible for black to play d5 here cd i mean as a temporary sack okay he could, he could you know get that pawn in return and try and keep this bishop blocked but the bishop's also got this diagonal potentially it's not that bad the bishop especially considering this bishop is stuck over there it can't easily shift to that diagonal so this notion this 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 evil threat of d5 is not not so um hasn't got too much of a punch to it so from a strategic crush perspective which i think is really tied up with garbage pawn moves i think i've lost starting to lose the strategic battle just with this one pawn move here d5 i don't know if you guys agree with that d5 if we if we can automatically visualize knight outposts every time we play a pawn move may, maybe that would help you know because then you can work out the knight maneuvers needed you can work backwards you can say well if there's a knight here how would it get there oh well it can get there from g6 from e7 a little bit of calculation as well but basically every pawn move is you know creating potentially losing weaknesses 
you know, when you play E4, you're potentially creating losing weaknesses. The point is, you factor in all, all you know, the, the dynamic factors, and you know, sometimes it's worth the risk. But here, okay, I'm keeping the bishop potentially, you know, active on the diagonal, but it's actually also keeping this bishop active on the diagonal as well. So if these bishops get exchanged, I'll be weakening C3. I'll be weakening my king if my king's over here. So this D5 strategic decision. I think was very bad. I mean, let's also try and demonstrate black slowly building up for d5 to imprison the bishop. Because I think, that if remember, there was a Petrosian Fisher game where World Championship uh, candidates match where where Fisher had blocked in Petrosian's bishop. But um, okay, so let's go for d5 here. Again, you know, an engine move here is actually d5 is actually weakening slightly the, the dark squares, potentially giving me these these outposts. But also, this bishop has got access to this diagonal. In fact, bishop a3 features as a good move here. And that will be kind of undermining uh, this pawn chain indirectly, if I can have the option to take on e7 and on d5. But there's other moves here. Even Let's, let's take this scenario with the blocked-in bishop. It's got this diagonal still. So really, it's not even that big a deal. In this position, Rivka kind of likes white's position. So unfortunately, um, although actually, <laughs> it's, it's starting to think black's looking quite good. Maybe, maybe this, this is what I was worried about, that um, there, is, there is a downside to black blockading d5. This bishop's made to look a bit silly. And one of the points of playing, you know, the Larson kind of system with b3 was to have a nice dangerous bishop on the diagonal. But even so, I think there's going to be a better way of playing this. Okay. So we're giving c6 as an example. Let's let's do c6 again. D5. Let's let's follow another idea. Knight takes, bishop takes. Just play maybe as a reverse French. I mean, if I was playing it as a reverse French, you know, I could even consider a move like b6, because if if this happens, you know, black doesn't want to give the c5 post, you know, white can later play king b1 and rook c5. I've had games like that. So I can play it like reverse French. Let's, let's, let's not think about the engine. I don't think the engine really understands the pawn structure too much here. But as a reverse French, you know, with the king over here, you want to sort of generate attacking opportunities over here, then keeping it closed with c5. Although that's usually a tension, um, you know, reducing move, you know, re killing the option for c takes d5, it might not be too bad in this scenario with the king over here to play a move like c5 later. So I, I think overall d5 was a strategic blunder. One of the worst strategic blunders available. Uh, and this is independent of any ideas of creating imbalances. Like this, this is to do with you know, the notion of strategic crush. How is it possible uh, to, to claim you're strategically crushing the opponent or, or to try and do that if you're cap creating gaping gaping holes in your own pawn structure. So e5 is actually a gaping hole. So anyway, knight g4, and now another casual pawn move, which is really kind of bad, because I'm a bit worried about f4s now, and maybe e3s. I'm a bit worried tactically, and I'm thinking I want to be able to like take and expose the king. So I play another weakening pawn move, g3, which again is probably kind of unnecessary. Let's just check this position. Just queen d2 getting on with it would have been much better, I think. This this would have been fine. I've castled queen side. Okay, I cannot do f3 because of e3 being weak. So it's a it's it's not that big an advantage for white, if at all. And I've also you know I've, this this pawns I've blocked in my own attack. You know his bishop's kind of good on c3, and maybe you know I'm going to get attacked on on the queen side. It's not brilliant. I think actually black's slightly better here. So really, I've I've kind of mucked something up here. Um, let's continue with the game anyway. G3 and Black's advantage grows now because of these gaping holes everywhere. So Queen D2, he's got the option of taking the pawn now even, but he just goes here, and it's starting to be really unpleasant. Okay, so. I can still maybe castle and allow knight f3. It's probably better than what I play. Bishop e2. 
and now I can't cast for queen side because of the f2 weakness. a6, so stopping any knight b5 to d4, which might justify d5 a little bit to use that d4 square. And also, of course, there's potential for b5s later. And I realize here also that I can't even which I might have been able to do in a blitz game, just play rook f1 and cheekily castle queenside. Because rook f1 is is like knight, knight h2 threatening um, the rook and also f3 and forking my king and queen. So there's quite dire tactical implications, all stemming from this earlier poor, arguably poor strategic decision to play d5. But there was, it was a lesser evil decision because I, I didn't like the scenario necessarily with black playing d5 but the point is I would have been more aware of it being a lesser evil decision if maybe I'd visualized more clearly night outposts hence hence the exercise at the start of this video so anyway I'm getting in all sorts of tactical trouble now because of black's knights in this position and I play an unbalancing pawn set which he thinks was was a good good try was one of the only you know decent tries in the position so I second knight for a pawn to try and expose the king on the g-file. Okay, so he's a piece up, but I'm also potentially rounding up this pawn. So black's advantage theoretically is about a pawn up, okay, or less than a pawn now after rook, rook uh, g3. I mean, it's starting to look as though I'm going to be okay here, although here I can just take the pawn immediately and return back. So this would be kind of dangerous for the black king. So yeah, I've I've created, as I mentioned in the previous video, you know, these, these imbalances by by sacking a piece. I wanted some sort of gambit, and I've got it here, a whole piece gambit. But his king's evacuating now, and it's quite good this king evacuation to e7. So he is a very resourceful, experienced player. He's not leaving his king over there, and he's actually positioning it quite well over here. Okay, so now. Um, face with f3, plays queen f7. I, I really thought I was doing alright here at this point. f3, knight f6, and I also factored in, you know, if I play rook g5, if there's ever a rook takes here, you know, f takes, I'm straightening out my pawns. So I play rook g5. Okay, rook a e8. And I'm also a bit wary, you know, I don't want to release this bishop, so that's that pawn's good, you know, keeping the bishop locked in. And I'm starting to think, you know, what about b4, c5 to try and, exp you know, get to his king to make sure king d8, I might, I may be able to flick in queen d4 to b6 without any problem for discovered attacks on my queen. So I want to use d4 as a pivot square. So hence I played b4, uh, just to try and undermine d6 and gain access, you know, weaken that potentially these, these, uh, gain, gain that access route. So rook g8, c5, fine. Rook g6, Unfortunately, now after king b1, rook e g8, I play a very panicky uh, move which gives up a lot of key squares, uh, in particular e5. So this is really, really bad strategically. Uh, the problem is, you know, how do I easily make any progress here? I am a piece down, but um, I mean, a, a simple move like rook g1 uh, might have. Being out, uh, you know, keeping hold of the position. It, actually, if we add a bit to here, what about just rook hg1? Don't want to give up any squares. I want to keep that mechanism of fg. I think rook hg1, king d8, and it remains kind of, you know, unbalanced here. Piece for for two pawns, a knight for two pawns, but um, it's starting to look a bit better. You know, cd cd, b5. Okay, because potentially this this diagonal is useful. Say queen f8. You know, black dare not take basically this this rook, and given that's the case, you know, I think this would have kept the position kind of locked in. If knight h5 here, that's much better than the game. The knight being over here rather than being more central like here. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the game, I pl it's another strategic disaster now based on pawn structure. So um. You know, although I, I talk about strategic crush, I, I haven't really been putting it in practice here w with respect to garbage pawn moves. Remember, the pawns are the slowest aspect of the position, so they are the most strategic aspect to consider. So getting your pawn moves right is kind of key. So rook hg1 here, and, you know, it would have still been a big battle ahead. 
okay because the knight position on h5 is not 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 that bad like so this relation is just quickly um review it here if um rook hg1 and we're saying in this position if rook g5 fg knight h5 just wondering f4 even here f4 so this bishop still locked in from that pawn this bishop's potentially coming on that diagonal king e7 you know white is not doing too badly here this would have been okay compensation but I, I let the whole position slip now I don't know maybe I'm getting slightly weary being a piece of not it was a panic again but um I play a terrible move now after rook e g a I play e four thinking you know maybe optimistic i'm going to get you know e five in at some point, but he just of course takes he takes on g five and he gains a massive square for his knight now, so I'm really getting done over now positionally um and I try and generate some play uh with this e five so losing all my pawns again, so I'm full knight down now. Yes, it's not the most pretty game, but I'm still thinking. You know, you know, maybe b5 and bishop a3 is going to be potentially dangerous. His king's still stuck in the centre, uh, so let's not give up just just quite yet. So queen d4, he takes another pawn. So b5, trying to get to his king, and after bishop a3, I am threatening um, a not so subtle tactic, which um, he kind of blundered with rook c8. But um, fortunately for him, it's not totally a decisive blunder, losing those two pieces for the rook, because this is still a very difficult position here. In this position, black's doing very well. There's now threats of uh, rook e8 coming down c1, queen c1s if bishop ever moves. If queen d6, you know, he just takes the queen, then he takes on c3. So this is not a good position here, unfortunately. So... Um, it's gone very, very downhill. In fact, you could argue that this e4 was a, even a much worse decision here um, than than the earlier d5 uh, pawn move. This really compounds, exposes e5 as a major weakness because you know when he takes on g5, he's actually undermining e5. If this pawn goes over here, e5, you know, less of a grip. So this really actually. Is, is a big candidate for the worst pawn move of the game, e4, in fact. Okay, so this diabolical position, um, he, he blunders, but um, I play queen e1, and he kind of simplifies it down. Now, there's there's a lot of tasty choices like rook e8 for black anyway, but he simplifies it down because um, he's getting a bit tired, but that's a very good uh, decision practically. Um, so even though this is an opposite color bishop pawn ending, my pawn's blockaded by his bishop, and this pawn is going to lock this bishop into just observing that pawn. <laughs> so the a bishop observation uh, scenario, and um, unfortunately, um, I'm I'm getting to like last five minutes as well, and I've got potentially good drawing chances uh, here. If I didn't um, horrifically blunder the way I did, if I'd kept the king out to stop nicking this pawn as well, maybe there's some good drawing chances. Um, even the move like king b3, which seems very distant, if we have a look at this position, say he did go now after you know my, my bishop, I can always sack the bishop and try and get the king to d7. So let's follow uh, this through. Not not sack the bishop. Sorry, <laughs> let's move the bishop here. So it takes, and I should be able to draw this because his king's going to take a long time to get back. He could actually even lose this. This would be equal. Ribka's giving this as equal now. Um, this position. So his king's having to get back on this journey. If I get in bishop, uh, if I get in. D I'm just about uh, this position because I'm getting his pawn from behind. So he can't go for my pawn. Okay, so I should be able to draw that. Okay, so rather sickly. Um, well, I was I was only in the last few minutes, but um, now in the end game to allow his king.
uh, to get to my new pawn, unfortunately. I lost the kind of opposition here. So I'm on, I'm on a rail track now. If you remember a previous video about rail tracks and kings. Um, if I just keep the king out to stop getting this pawn. So a move like king b3 even. Or just, you know, uh, shouldn't lose in this position. Uh, it's unfortunate. After all that, all that drama in the game. Coming back um, after that tactical... Um, mistake by him. I know, uh, but he, you know, I, uh, th this is now just losing the A pawn in the game, unfortunately. So, <laughs> it's another, yeah, interesting but maybe instructive game uh, for you guys. My pain is your gain. <laughs> I hope. So, if nothing else, my pain is also my gain as well, I hope. So, I don't know. This was interesting stuff. Uh, but so maybe you know maybe the d5 it wasn't needed just simple you know queen d2 castles let the bishop become a prisoner uh, because you know my king's over here if my king's over here I can sort of work on opening the position later on on the king side or even not not play you know this pawn move just just keep the pawn over here and just just queen d2 castles queen side then later you know bishop e to f3 g4 at some point or you know takes and then g4 g5 there are other plans available but um i think you know i really did let him into the game quite significantly with this d5 so i think that's one of the main points uh of strategic uh problems but the other main uh point coming up later is when i do get a knight horns uh this e4 is absolutely terrible. I'm tempted, unfortunately, to play the move e4 when he doubles up here. When I could have just supported the rook here. And, um, okay, I'm going to lose h6, potentially. Maybe that's what I was worried about, losing h6. But there might actually be a tactical problem with rook h6, because Rip is not mentioning it, I wonder. Interesting. Waiting for rook takes h6. Does this ca come down to pure calculation? e4 here... Yes, e4 here doesn't give, of course, or does it, the option of rook takes g5. No, fg, because g takes will be check. That's the key point. Rook takes g5 wouldn't be possible. So actually, the promise of e5 is much more fulfillable in this, in this particular position. So maybe this is just about okay, losing that h6 pawn. So I didn't calculate this, that uh, here... There's actually now a real concrete threat of e5 instead of losing e5, so a massive knight coming back to e5. So this position uh, may be interesting to, to consider as well. But again, you know, black's still better. He's, he's a piece up, and I'm opening up this bishop now. So say a check. But even so, better than you know the game continuation. The king's you know a bit exposed. There might be some practical chances. In fact, the evaluation shift is almost coming down. Uh, Almost. Um, so maybe with some with some accurate play, yeah. Here, like e6, it starts to get a bit dangerous for Black. Okay, so there's a couple of major strategic errors in this game. I think e5 and that later rook e4, not waiting for rook takes h6. So I didn't really calculate that as well. But I don't know about this. Plan. I mean, maybe this plan was too committal to block up, you know, the H file in effect. Because you really want open lines, especially if you're castling opposite sides. Maybe line opening is key, not, you know, to, to make sure you've got an H or G line. I mean, as it turned out in the game, you know, his king evacuated anyway because I did get the G line, and it was a very interesting game after that. Well, I hope there's instructive points here. Um, I know I've waffled on and repeated quite a few ideas, but I hope that might reinforce the idea that pawn moves are really potentially damaging to your position. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.